Next, we'll be hearing from Chris Gavreau. I have a trade union friend, and he said to me, the extreme right opposes the war in Afghanistan. Ron Paul opposes the war in Afghanistan. Patrick Buchanan opposes the war in Afghanistan because it interferes with their ability to wage war on working people here at home. I think that's the essence of the matter. We go into a discussion of strategy for the anti-war movement in the context of the deepest world economic crisis, perhaps in, in world history, where the ruling corporate powers of all the countries are in, are in such competition with each other that they are all trying to drive the wages and working conditions of, of working people around the world to the lowest possible place. And what happens when that is the goal of the corporate elites around the world? What did they do in the 30s is what they're trying to do today. They fund extra um, electoral right-wing organizations. They, they fund them. They give them support. They, they create a situation where if they need them to function in a paramilitary way, to use their troops against the organizations of working people, gay people, women, pe women, etc., they can. Now, in Europe today, where the economic crisis is very is extremely deep, we are seeing a significant rise in right and neo-fascist organization and mobilization in every country. The British National Party's been pulling 20%. Italy's been racked by anti-immigrant pogroms. We see the signs, um, that we see some signs that there's a progressive leadership emerging, but so far our side is mostly uh, beset by demoralization because of the capitulation of social democratic forces on the assault of the living standards and dignity of the populations. Here it's a little less extreme. But the, up to this point, the demobilization of labor and social movements that accompanied the Obama election has not been overcome. And this means that there is a tremendous vacuum. Koch Foundation, other major corporate interests are stepping into that vacuum, funding the Tea Party, funding the, the election campaigns and propaganda of the far right. And and in the absence of a labor fight back, this is extremely dangerous situation for social justice activists and working people. Now, the question is, how do we build an anti-war movement? How do we reach, build a majority movement? How do we have the broadest audience? Is it, act is it true, as Kevin says, that if we align with the right, we have a larger audience? Absolutely not. The vast majority of people, that work, people in this country that we have to appeal to work for a living. They're losing their jobs, their health care, their, their houses are being foreclosed upon, they're being deported. The center of working class struggle in this country is in Arizona, where the immigrant workers are fighting the, the fight for social justice. What is the program of those people that Kevin suggests will strengthen our movement? Ron Paul has put forward legislation that the U.S. government not be allowed to disarm the paramilitaries on the border with Mexico. Ron Paul says that our economic problems are because of Social Security, that in 2040 it's going to be half of our budget, which is a bald-faced lie. Patrick Buchanan talks about the red scare, you know, the red dawn, the brown tide sweeping over our country. Is it possible? What does it mean to make an anti-war coalition, an anti-war alliance? We'll talk about what it means in Congress. But on the street, what does it mean? We would have a demonstration. What's a united front? You take the leaders of the coalitions and you put them on a stage. Does anyone actually think that if we put Patrick Buchanan on the stage, at, that any immigrant worker would come to a demonstration, that any unionist would come to a demonstration, these people pose an existential threat to our very ability to organize in this country. They want to get rid of public education, but we want to organize a fight for education, not war. 
They want to, they oppose, you know, health care. They oppose women organizing as women, and they oppose blacks organizing as blacks, and they say that is not the basis for, for the, no fight for rights can occur on that basis. One's rights derive from one's private property. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't have any private property, <laughs> nor do the majority of the people that I am trying to organize into this movement. Now, we have to argue with everybody in this country about the war. But that discussion is increasingly linked with our perspective about how to win the fight for jobs, how to rebuild public education, how to defend the rights especially of immigrant work workers. That's the alliance we need. And it, the, uh, to organize a visible working alliance with the extreme right basically precludes our ability to ever organize the majority of this country against wars and empire. Is it true that an alliance with the right will help us defeat empire? I say absolutely not. The only force on this planet who actually has the self-interest to end wars in imperial occupations are the working people of the world, and we will end it in solidarity with each other we will not do it by normalizing the discourse, the political activity of these people whose whole political program is to destroy the organization of working people, immigrants, and women in this country. That is an impossibility. Now, what is the, is somebody going to give me a time, or one minute? What is, okay, <laughs> the proudest uh, accomplishment of the so-called right-left alliance has been in Congress the Barney Frank Ron Paul letter and proposal to cut the military budget I ask you to look at the report of the task force from this group what are they proposing do you think this is an anti-war resolution read it it's about a better more efficient military, a better way to maintain empire no matter what Ron Paul's rhetoric is about.